so given putting that as sort of a, a precondition, what would be the sort of process by which you think uh, folks in the business community could see it being fixed? Because at some point, presumably, we have to pass laws around it somehow. Yeah. And I think it's everybody in Washington's lament that they have to go through here. But what are our alternatives? I would say the biggest thing government, I think, could do is just start making sure that everybody is completely aware of uh, the quality that's actually done in hospitals and the quality of doctors. Because I'm a fundamental believer that quality drives lower cost and better outcomes. Everybody wins. And if you could just have transparency of that data so that somebody can go online and actually see what's going to happen or they can go online and actually uh, see what the uh, recommendation is they're getting and how does that fit. We do this thing with Mayo Clinic for our own employees where uh, before they get an operation, they can actually go through this site, talk with somebody from the Mayo Clinic. A third of the people change what they were going to do. And I give them a $250 credit regardless of what they choose, just so that they go through the system. A third of the people change it. We follow up a year and two years afterwards to, to hear, are you satisfied with your decision? Every one of them is. And we just don't seem to allow that kind of discussion today. And I think largely because the data is just not available. So I'm very much in favor of this new HHS initiative that Secretary Sebelius has started on the patient safety mm -hmm. uh, initiative. I think that makes all the sense in the world. And if we can just start getting a focus on quality and quality outcomes, I think we'd be surprised where we could get to. Mm -hmm. Tamara, you've done a, an enormous amount of work on credit and uh, the, the way particularly young people, but, but Americans in general, use it. And I think at this point, it's perfectly well understood that a large credit bubble had something to do with both our current uh, economic condition, but also our current deficits. Now, there are a lot of explanations for why we had a credit bubble, and some of them have to do with products being pushed, and some of them have to do with uh, people trying to increase their living standards at a point when they seem to be stagnating a bit. But one of them has to be a desire for the things credit buys, a desire for excess credit. And that's true in Washington as well. And given the skill with which Wall Street and others uh, are, are capable of repackaging and, and, and creating ways to have excess credit, it seems that so long as the desire is there, there will always be a product to meet it. So how do you think about that? How going forward do people get a better sense of the debts they can and can't hold. And that's true, I think, both on the, on the individual level and on the governmental level. How sort of do we match the desire for what we can get with excess credit with a more realistic vision of the credit we can handle? Well, it's a great question um, with a couple built-in assumptions that I disagree with. Mm -hmm. And one is this idea that um, all Americans have become sort of consumer driven and are running up credit cards to pay for luxury vacations and nice shoes um, or fancy golf clubs. So a lot of the research I've done um, looks at why are low to middle income households going into debt. Now keep in mind that the debt bubble happened at the same time that technology allowed uh, underwriting to be processed in a millisecond, but it also happened at the same time that earnings started to decline and that the costs of basics like health insurance, like housing, like college, all started to rise. What was happening, particularly for low to moderate income households, is credit was available to them at a time when their incomes were no longer covering their costs. The top reasons people gave for being in credit card debt, car repair, job loss, medical expenses. So credit cards were the safety net, along with home equity. A lot of people took home equity out not to you know, build an annex um, onto their house, but to help pay for college, to get through a job loss. Lots of basic reasons why people would go in debt. Um, so I think we, we often portray debtedness as the same. I think a lot of the um, consumption habits of the upper class are being um, transferred to everybody else. And it's simply inaccurate that it's a keeping up with the Joneses that has low and middle income people so strapped. Um, there's a fundamental structural problem in their balance sheets. And just to sort of make that point, because you mentioned young people, I think w when we look at the deficit problem, one of the things that worries me is we're so focused on what's happened post-recession. And I think an important thing to keep in mind about what has happened in the middle class, which if you ask me the way to solve the deficit is to, to have economic policy be focused on 
expanding and strengthening the middle class. In a generation, in the last 30 years, the typical earnings for young workers, these are full-time, full-year workers, 25 to 34, so I'm not talking about people flipping burgers, although a lot of them do. I'm talking about people who are raising families, who are in the sort of prime years of, of life. The earnings for all men, age 25 to 34, men today in that age group earn 87 cents compared to the dollar their dads earned in 1980. Now women have done a little better. They make a dollar 10. It took 30 years to get that 10 cents. But the only group in a generation of young workers that has more earning power than their parents are young women with college degrees. And by college degrees, I mean four years more. So I think that the issue of living standards and the, the basic um, earning power of the middle class and what has happened to it and how it's only gotten worse from the recession, but it was already there into the recession is a really important point to keep in mind when we're thinking about the things we need to invest in as a nation. And, and granting, all, uh, granting particularly that last point, I read a lot of um, terrifically pessimistic viewpoints about the next five, 10 years in the American economy. So let's say they don't come true in their worst scenarios, but let's say we get a sort of an average scenario. Growth is somewhat slow. You're not going to see an incredibly fast-paced rise in living standards. How do, those, how do those pieces fit together? So for a while, we had credit that was filling some of that hole. Is that going to come back in some form, or will people just have to adjust to a more sort of realistic view of where we are as a country? Or w w what do you see in the, next, in the next sort of short-term period as we begin to recover, but don't quite begin yeah. to race forward? It's a great question because a lot of the safety valves have been shut off, credit. Um, I think we're seeing some of it already. You have um, food banks are seeing people, a population they never served before. Food stamp participation is up. You know, I would argue that a lot of those households probably would have hidden that need with a credit card three, four, five years ago. Credit card debt masked a lot of deep anxiety and insecurity for a really long time. I don't think we know exactly what's going to happen. I don't think it bodes well for mobility. I think you're going to have um, young people who are making choices about whether they can complete school or what kind of school they go to based on access to credit, based on the fact that they can't earn enough to pay their way through school anymore because tuition has tripled in 30 years. So um, I think the answer is it's a moving target. Um, and I think we have more people reliant on public resources right now than ever before. And the shrinkage of credit is not completely disconnected from that. And Megan, you, you and I are policy writers. And so we, I think, have a particular affection for well, something we're seeing a lot of today, which are big plans big, interesting, policy ambitious plans that if you pass them, it will cut the debt by $6 trillion and ensure everybody in the country and carbon externalities will begin to be priced in, sort of on and on down the line. But of course, some of the times that we've actually moved on deficits, we've seen rather than very, very, rather than sort of big bang theories, of it, we've seen a series of smaller bills passed over a more extended period of time. Uh, in the 90s, of course, we had three or four uh, separate deficit reduction bills, none of them necessarily gigantic, but all of them significant. How do you see it going this time? Obviously, the big plans get the most attention, but do you th think we're going to have, we're going to do it at once or have a, a variety of bites of the apple? I think there's, there's a couple of questions that go into that, because I, I, I wonder about the same thing. So <laughs> I, I will outline my thinking a little bit, which is um, earlier, the choices were smaller and easier. They were you know, you, you fiddle here, you do that. Right now, it's basically, it's Medicare and Social Security, and that's it, and, and defense to some extent. And I think that even Republicans are starting to come around to the notion that, like, if they have to choose between tax cuts and defense, they might be willing, or between tax increases and cutting defense, they might be willing to cut defense. So I think we know where the big three areas it's going to have to come out of. There's not really any extra room, and, and part of it is we already did some of the kind of easy, obvious stuff that's coming back to bite us now, like the sustainable growth, growth rate for physician payments in Medicare, um, which has been annually fixed by Congress uh, to the point where um, if we actually allowed this, it's an automatic re uh, reimbursement reduction, if we actually allowed it to go into effect, it would cut the reimbursements by 30% in a year. and so. It's never going to actually go into effect as far as anyone 
can tell. Um, the other thing that I think is that there's a real danger in budgeting, and I, I also write a lot about um, consumer finance, and one of the things that really strikes me when I talk to people who have gotten themselves into deep trouble, and I don't mean someone who like maybe ran up $5,000 and it, it took them you know, a couple years to, to get the balance all paid off, but um, someone who's really gotten themselves into deep credit card problem. So when you talk to them and you, you talk to them about what their thought process was, um, they ask themselves, can I afford this, right? Can I afford to go see my mother who's not feeling well? Can I afford to um, send my kid to private Christian school? Can I afford to do this? What they don't do, and, and in each case they can, they can afford to do any of these things, but they can't afford to do all of the things that they end up doing. And I think, so there's a real danger in budgeting, you have to always be actually thinking about all of your priorities at once. And so with things like Social Security, and I think back to the retirement age, and I may be a little biased, my grandfather owned a gas station in western New York, which is uh, it's pretty heavy physical labor out there pumping gas, and he did it until he was 88. And, and so, and like my relatives in general, my farmer relatives were out there feeding the cattle. Uh, one of my great aunt like would drive to the barn to feed the cows because she was, she couldn't walk anymore. Um, and so like I, I don't tend to think that retiring at 68 is some sort of catastrophic, horrifying thing that, um, that working class people don't understand. Um, but even then, right, it costs a lot of money to not have people retire later. And frankly, I don't think the economy, whether or not it's through private savings or through uh, government finance savings, can afford to have one person, two people in the workforce supporting one person out of it forever, which is essentially what we're talking about. I mean, whether that's from private capital or from the government, that's just, that's a really difficult, a third of your earnings essentially have to go to feed someone else's consumption before you even account for your kids or anyone else who needs help. That's just the retirees. So I don't think that that math works no matter how you play it out. But also, if you think it's really expensive, is this what we would spend that money on? And you know, I, someone said to me once when I was at a panel, well, Social Security is easy to fix. All we have to do is raise the, get rid of the cap on Social Security earnings. Well, all? That's a 12% tax increase. I mean, it's an, levying a 12% surtax on all incomes above 106 thousand dollars a year. That's a really large tax increase. 12 percent is big, right? And even if you think that we have to do that, and I think you, know, you can argue that maybe that's where we do have to go, would you spend that money on, on letting people retire at 62 instead of 65 or 68? We have a lot of priorities as a nation. You know, whether, whether you're, you want to cut taxes, whether you want to do more spending on health care, you know, cover more people, whatever it is, most people, in fact, I don't think that would be the priority that they would select. Yes, I want everyone to retire at 62, and so I'm not going to fund education. I'm not going to fund science research. I'm not going to fund those things. I want to let everyone retire at 62, and that's all I care about doing. And that's the real problem with trying to do it piecemeal, is that at this point, we're really talking about trade-offs between a small number of really big programs, and you have to think about that comprehensively, because otherwise what you will do is end up telling yourself, <laughs> I can afford to do this, I can afford to do that, I can afford to do this third thing, and you will end up in a disaster because you can't afford to do all three of them.